Welcome back, everyone. For today, what we're going to do, we will run through a couple of exercises. We'll see how we can prepare for the exams, how we can prepare for the, for the tests. And we're going to have a mock test for us, uh, just to help you understand what you can do for preparations and how you analyze the questions as they come. What we're going to do, basically, we will have a case study. And each case study is going to have its own unique set of questions. Some of them are going to be very much based on the case study itself. Others are going to be a little hypothetical, but also around the case study to test your knowledge and understanding of the material that we've been through, that we've studied together for the past few weeks. And for the very first case study that we have for ourselves for this week is one about a company, a food manufacturing company. It's called Lombards. And uh, Lombards is basically a U.S.-based company. They've been doing really well. You have all the details about the case study in this slide, so you can go through it. You can read it all at your own pace. But in short, Lombards is doing very well. They're considering a few financing options. And what they're also considering is to expand their operations internationally. They would like to go to Europe and they would like to have a base in Europe for themselves due to the uh, good progress that they've been doing in the European market. And with these details, uh, of course, you can see some of the data of their financial data, their debt to equity ratio. You can see what their stocks were sold for in, in the markets and how they've been traded. Uh, you have all the data available here for you. And so we are going to be using this data as we go through the questions, the set of questions that we will start working on right now. For us, first things first, let's start with the very first question. So the first question here is asking us about how, how likely is it for the company, for Lombards to basically, how easy for them is it going to be to benefit from issuing a preferred shares. And so this question very much looks into your understanding of what preferred shares are and how they could benefit an organization. And so you will need to recall the material that you studied perhaps in the very first unit that we've done, that we've that we've looked into together. You also have to go deeper into the reading of the first unit. And so for us, let's try to analyze this together and see how we can answer this question. If we want to look at preferred shares, what are some of the unique attributes of preferred shares? You can look at the set of answers that we have right here and try to analyze these answers. Let's start first with basically having access to preemptive rights. Now, if you remember from what we've been studying together and from your readings, uh, preemptive rights are basically rights that are associated to existing shareholders. And so these new, uh, these existing shareholders basically have the right to acquire new shares that are issued by the company. And before these shares are issued to the public or offered to the public. And so this very much is what preemptive rights are. Now, if we want to look at answer number B, which is basically access to declare dividends. Now, do you think that access to declare dividends is actually one of the attributes of preferred shares? Or perhaps is it an attribute of common shares? Now, of course, if we want to look at common shares, here this is something else. And basically common shares is very much associated with voting rights. And that's why if you look at answer number D, you will see that it represents what common shares are. If you look at answer number C, which is basically about property rights, this is mostly associated with creditors. And so this is what you need to think about when you start analyzing the answers. And what you have to remember is the attributes of the question itself and how it fits one of the answers that you have. And based on the analysis that we've done together, you can see very much that answer number B is the correct answer for us because preferred shares are very much all about dividends. Now, to take another example and to take another question and try to answer it together and see how we can analyze again these answers together. Question number two is about Lombards thinking about issuing new shares. And so because they are issuing new shares, the question asks us about the role that the SEC would have in the process of issuing of, of, of new shares. 
And here again, let's start analyzing basically what the role of e, the C is. If we want to take the, the first answer, so the first possible answer, which is number eight, it basically says that the, SEC, the SE evaluates different merits of the securities offering. And if we really want to look at this, now the evaluation criteria is not something related to the SEC. So the SEC does not evaluate the merits of the securities offering. Now, similarly, of course, question number C. Now, in question number C, the SEC basically reviews the registration statements and tries to check the registration for compliance purposes. And so it doesn't necessarily uh, say if the investment is a good investment or not. So this is not the role of the SEC. Now, the other role that the SEC plays is basically the protection role for investors. And so Taking these into consideration, you can see that question number B and the possible answer here, number B is the correct answer. So the SEC basically reviews the statements only and it doesn't have any extra authority to state whether this investment is a good investment or not. It does not evaluate the merits of the security. And at the same time, its role is, is basically limited to the protection of investors themselves. Now, if we move on to question number three, and let's try to apply also this, a similar reasoning. Question number three asks us about Lombards and thinking, coming from a hypothetical perspective, because as you can see from the merits of the question, from the merits of the case, the standings of Lombards, the financial standings of Lombards is not going to place them in a position to be labeled as junk bonds. This is again, very much the general perspective and the general consensus from the merits of the case. However, this particular question, and as we will see the next question, both of them are very much hypothetical and trying to, un to, to prompt you to think about junk bonds and see whether there is the possibility of something or of the bonds for Lombards to become junk bonds or not. And so, at this stage, what we're trying to find out is your understanding of junk bonds and what junk bonds are really all about. And so here, what you need to do is to recall your unit number three and try to refresh your memory about it and about what junk bonds are, what rising star bonds are, because these are going to be basically what will help you answer this question. Let's take the first uh, few answers, answers A, B, and C. Now, answer A is basically stating that a junk bond is one that has a high risk of default on paying the face value of the dividend. Now, this is a little misleading. As we will see also, B and C are similarly misleading because junk bonds are not necessarily related to the face value or exactly to the, uh, to, to the dividend. We will see now the correct answer and how we can analyze and reach that correct answer. If we go again to question or to the possible answer, number B, or to basically what it says or what it states that junk bonds are high risk by nature. And so because of the, due to their high risk nature of default on paying and repaying the face value and the principal, Again, this similarly to question A is a little to, to possible answer number A is a little misleading and is not does not accurately describe what junk bonds are. And so same thing applies for number C. However, the correct answer, as we can as we can see, is number D. And this is because when we talk about junk bonds, these essentially have a high risk of default on payment of basically the principal and the interest rate. So it is not associated directly to the dividend. It's rather associated to the interest rate. And it's not directly associated to the face value of the bond. It's associated with the principal of the bond itself. Now, following on from the previous question, this is again another hypothetical question that does not necessarily, does not necessarily mean that Lombards in, is in that position or could be in that position. However, we're trying just to understand whether you and you have mastered 
your studies in terms of uh, understanding the junk bonds and understanding the rising star bonds. Here, what we're trying to find out is the possibility of a junk bond becoming a rising star bond. And for this, we need to start analyzing and understanding what are the different perspectives that we have here. And generally, when we talk about junk bonds, as we saw, junk bonds are have a low credit rating by nature. Due to their low credit rating, their, their credit rating, basically their low credit rating stems from the fact that they have a high risk on, uh, of defaulting. And because of this, if we want to transform this junk bond into a rising star, what we need to think about is how can we transform this high risk of default into something that could entice investors to be more to feel more secured in investing in that in this particular bond. And here, as we can see, the only way that we can do this is by playing around with our finances and strengthening our financial standing. And so to strengthen our financial standing, what we need to look into is how can we make this happen? The best way, based on the merits of the case that we have, is through expanding through our operations that we have in the EU. And this would help us access a new market. And through the access of the, to this new market, we will equally have a good financial record because we have a high demand on the products that this company has already in the European market. And so from all these different answers that we have, Number D is the correct answer for this particular for this particular question. Now, moving on, if we look at question number five, and here we're trying to understand whether whether why should Lombards basically issue preferred stocks rather than opt for a different type of a financing option, and this is very much all about preferred stocks. So you need to recall your knowledge about preferred stocks and you need to understand what are the different what are the different financing options available to to companies let's start with analyzing the different questions the different possible answers that we have and see which one applies to our case together now if we look at the first possible answer number 8 it states that basically because it allows lombards to dilute the shares of uh, other investors that preferred stocks is going to be something that investors will probably look into. And at the same time, it is most, more suitable for Lombards. However, this is not accurate. As we can see, and as we understand from, from, from the material that we've been through, share dilution is not necessarily something that presents profit to the, to the company, or basically that entices investors to invest in an organization. And share dilution is very much related to a particular type of, 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 uh, of stocks. And this type of stocks is something that you will need to look and do some research on to find out what this particular stock is all about. And then you'll probably be able to answer one of the following questions that we will have together now. Now, if we look at answer number B, as you can see, B states that Preferred stocks is basically one of the good options because it allows Lombards, it allows the company to raise funds without necessarily incurring any debt. Now, of course, this is a quality of all different types of stocks because when you issue stocks and when you issue shares as an organization, it is a type of equity financing rather than debt financing. And so here, what we're talking about is something that is a little bit general. Now, if we go into question number C, now question number C is based as if we go into answer number C. So answer number C or the possible answer number C states that because preferred stocks allows Lombards to raise funds while having greater access to local investors. Again, this is a quality of all different stocks and not necessarily it will grant you access to local investors exclusively because once you issue stocks and these stocks are traded in the stock market then basically your stocks are available to the wider public and not to a very specific or niche public uh, a specific niche market for it and that's why this answer is inaccurate per se now the last possible answer 
that we have, which is number D, states that preferred stocks allows Lombards to raise funds while having greater access to international investors. Again, this is not necessarily accurate or not necessarily correct for the merits of the case because it doesn't only provide access to international investors, but also here what we're looking at, what we're looking at is that the fact that Lombard's financial positioning allows it to basically, oh, I got stuck here. Sure. Just number D, basically. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so far, yeah, it's good, but I got stuck again. <laughs> Hopefully we won't have that again. <laughs> I forgot even which question this was. I think this is number five. Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. I'm ready. All right. As we can see now, the possible answer, number T, states that preferred stocks are one of the best options because it allows access to international investors. Now, again, hypothetically, this is not a, an inaccurate statement because as with any type of stock issuance, you have access to wider groups of, of investors. However, if we go back to the merits of our case and if we look at the financial standings of our organization and we try to analyze that financial standings and try to tie it down to basically the question that we have, which is issuing preferred stocks and why preferred stocks would be much more suitable versus other types of stock versus other types of uh, financing options, whether equity financing or debt financing, we can see here is that answer B is very much the most accurate answer for this particular case or for this particular question. As we saw together, it's not necessarily that the other answers are wrong or that you may have other answers that are wrong and there's only one right, but you may have a series of right, right, question, right answers. However, one of them would be more accurate and more suitable for the case based on the merits that you have on the case itself. And so you'll need to analyze and you'll need to always recall the merits of the case before you answer any particular question. And so going back to our question here, we can see based on the data that we have about Lombards due to their strong financial standing, and it is a good option for them to continue on increasing their equity financing or to finance their operations through equity financing rather than debt financing. You have to recall again their debt to equity financing uh, numbers, and this is presented to you in the case. And there's again another question about the debt to equity ratio that we will go through together shortly in one of the uh, subsequent questions. Now, let's move on to the next question. Next question is asking you to place yourself as an investor and consider yourself investing in a particular financial instrument that is issued by Lombards. Now here, you are considering whether you'd like to invest in a floating rate bond or a fixed rate bond. What do you think would be more suitable for you as an investor? Here again, you are expected to recall the material that you learned from unit number four. And basically, you're asked to try to analyze the difference between floating rate bonds and between the fixed rate bonds. And as if you remember from what a fixed rate bonds is, now, a fixed bond, a fixed rate bonds, basically, doesn't make any sense for you to invest in because if the interest rate is rising, then there is no sense for you to invest in a, a fixed interest rate, a fixed rate bond. Now, the reason behind this is, and now again, I'm losing my trail of thoughts. Thank you. Great. Let me go through those again, just to see. Okay, I think I'm ready. Let's go. For us, what we need to do, we need to recall the unit number four, try to analyze the difference between float, fixed rate bonds and floating rate bonds, and try to see which one of these answers very much represents the correct answer based on the knowledge that we have about floating rate and fixed rate bonds. So if we can look at the very first possible answer, which is answer number A, it, it says that investing in fixed rate bonds is a good option because fixed rate bonds, basically, what they do they tend to perform better than traditional bonds. Now, 
again, this is somewhat misleading and you will be expected to have a deeper type of analysis as you go through this particular this particular question so you need to understand what are the dynamics of fixed interest fixed rate bonds and understand how fixed rate bonds work so you need to recall that material as you answer this particular uh, as you try to analyze this this particular question uh, this particular answer similarly if you're thinking about question if you're thinking about the possible answer number b where you are again recommending to where you recommend to invest in in fixed rate bonds but here you state that because it repays higher yields of in the, if the interest rate goes up again this is somewhat misleading why because of the dynamic of interest rates and how fixed rate work how fixed rate bonds work this does not really very much represent what fixed rate bonds is now if we go to number c what we're going to see is that the recommendation here is to invest in, in floating rate bonds because floating, according to this possible answer, floating rate bonds will receive higher income even if the interest rate falls. Again, this is not very much accurate because if we want to invest in floating rate bonds, one of the very important things that we're going to get out of it is the fact that it would remove interest rate risk from the equation. So it is going to help us hedge the interest rate risk. And so this is why question, uh, the uh, possible answer number D is the correct answer in this scenario. Moving on to the sixth, uh, to the seventh question. Here you are asked to assume yourself as you're working with Lombards on issuing an IPO. And as you're issuing an IPO, here you are asked to think about the different financial institutions that are helping you as an organization, so helping you as Lombards in facilitating this IPO. What you're expected to do here is to recall all the dates, all the details about unit number two and how IPOs are issued. Now, if you remember, there are different groups that are associated with the issuance of bonds, with the underwriting of these, with the issuance of stocks, and with the, with the underwriting of these of the initial public offerings. And what you'll need to remember is what are these different financial institutions that are involved in IPOs. And as you can see, central banks central banks do not have any role, active role that they play within the issuance of the, within the initial public offering. Similarly, insurance companies and retail banks, they don't have any role in that matter. So therefore, the correct answer is basically investment banks. Now, moving on to the next question, you will see that Lombard is, is trying to assess the efficiency of, its, of the market. And here, what we're trying to look into is the efficient market hypothesis and trying to understand what are the differences between efficient markets and inefficient markets. And so... This is very much all related to unit number four. And what you need to do is to recall the material that we studied there together and the material that you've read and that you've done your research on so that we are able to answer this particular question. So here, the question is asking us about the possible scenarios and that could lead to inefficient markets. Now, if you would remember from what we've, what we've worked on together, Efficient market hypothesis is very much related to the sharing of information in the market. That would allow us to basically have either efficient markets, inefficient markets, or semi-efficient markets. And based on the type of data or the type of information that is shared about the organization in the market. And normally, when we discuss or when we want to see how the shift from efficient markets into inefficient markets happen, the thing that we need to look into or the 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 the, uh, the variable that we need to look into is basically information asymmetry and that's why a question uh, the the possible answer number d is the correct answer among the others it's not very much related to lack of buyers nor is it related to the lack of sellers or lower transaction costs these variables are are absolutely wrong and they have no role in this uh, in in this in this question and so the main focus for efficient markets and to understand the efficient markets is basically information and on its own. And so keep this in mind as you try to recall all the data that we studied together in number four. 
Now, moving on to the next question, here what we're trying to understand is, again, the situation that Lombards could have a strong market hypothesis. And so, again, if we want to have a strong market hypothesis, we'll need to recall unit number four again and try to understand uh, and try to understand all the different material that we have about unit number four and about the market hypothesis. And if we remember from the market hypothesis, we are here trying to understand basically what kind of information is the information that would have a stronger influence on the market to make the hypothesis or to make the market hypothesis strong rather than weak. Now, the type of information here or from the different suggestions that we have and number A, uh, what we have is sharing of non-public information. Number B is the sharing of information in general. So that would include public and non-public information. So private information and public information. In number C, what we have is just looking at, at the price talks to the price talks and see how they are reflected. And in number C and in number D, what we're looking at futures, future stock prices and how they're reflected again today. So C and D are very much looking into stock pricing, which is a little irrelevant for what we're looking into. And so these two answers or possible answers could be discounted. Now, what we are left with are what our possible answer number A and number B. And among those, though number A is not necessarily wrong because part of having a strong market hypothesis is the sharing of non-public information, what to have a strong market hypothesis, we also need to we also need to counter in the public information that is available. And so this is why number B is the most accurate answer among, between B and A. So not necessarily that A is a wrong answer, but it is not as accurate as number B, because what we need to counter in for a strong market hypothesis is all information to be countered in into the stock price. So this includes private and public data. Now, if we move on to the next question here, what we're doing, the question basically is asking you to look at, to assume that you're working with Lombards on issuing a bond. And what you need to, uh, to do is basically look at some of the measures that would resemble the process associated with bond issuance. Now, this is very much all about bond issuance. And again, you need to recall unit number one to help you answer this particular question. And as you do this, you have to start analyzing in the same way that we analyzed all the different answers for the previous questions as well. So if we look at the first possible answer here, it says that you will start with showcasing your showcasing the showcase in, in, in roadshows. So the bonds will be placed in roadshows in the beginning, and then they'll be placed in markets. And after this, they will be rated by rating agencies. If you go into uh, the possible answer number B, which is again, it states that the bonds are going to be placed in the markets. And then after this, they will be showcased in road shows. And then finally, they'll be rated by rating agencies. C, on the other hand, states that you will start with the rating agencies first, then you'll go to road shows. And then finally, you'll place them in the market. D states that you will start with rating agencies, then you'll place them in the market, and then they will be showcased in, in, in road shows. Now here, what you need to do is recall the process of how bonds are issued. And based on the data that we have, based on the, based on all the information that we've shared together through, through our uh, sessions and through the reading material that you have, you can see that number C is the most accurate answer for this particular question. Now, if we're thinking about uh, the next question, which is mostly related to the expansion that uh, Lombards is thinking to do, which is basically to expand into an e into the EU market through an EU subsidiary. Which uh, the, the question is asking you to counter in Brexit and what are some of the possible the side effects or negative impacts that Brexit could have on Lombards expansion. And here you need to remember what are the what is the line of business that Lombards is, is involved in. And then also remember how this line of business could be affected by Brexit in, in general. And if you remember, Lombards is all about manufacturing food, food products. And so food products will be exported between different European countries. And given the access or the one, the single market, the single market in the EU, 
there was a freedom of movement of products between the different member states. And as the UK was part of these, was one of these member states, products were able to move freely. And so if we try to analyze now the different answers or possible answers that we have, the very first one basically states that Brexit is going to have a better access to international markets. Now, this is not necessarily wrong, but also not accurate or not correct, because if the main focus of Lombards was to go into the UK, was to set up an EU subsidiary in the UK just to be able to exploit the single market and to have better access to different markets in the EU, then this is likely not the correct answer for it. Now, cheaper shipping costs is again something that is misleading because as part of getting outside of the EU, the UK is likely going to encounter some difficulties in terms of shipping into the EU, there will be some extra tariffs that 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 that, that, and th that uh, companies would have to pay to import or to export products from and to the UK. Similarly, if we look at number C states that it will, there will be an easier import, easier import transactions between the UK and the EU, which is again misleading as this was the case pre-Brexit. However, post-Brexit, this would be a very much different as the UK will be now treated as a third country. Now, finally, if we go to answer or to the possible answer number D, which states that there will be extra export checks to the EU. This is the correct answer here, because again, as part of leaving the EU, the UK becomes a sovereign state, which means that it does not benefit from the single market, which means any products or any products that are being shipped from the UK to the EU will have to go through proper export checks. Again, here, you need to recall your knowledge and you need to recall the material that you studied at unit number eight. Now, moving on again into uh, the next question. Uh, here, what you have, the question basically states that one of the investors are advising, uh, one of the investors you're advising is keen to invest in Lombard's EU stocks. But this particular investor is concerned about some of the challenges associated with Brexit. What kind of advice would you give them in terms of uh, investing in the stocks. This is trying to test your knowledge, not only about Brexit and its implications, but also about the company's standing and the, and the demand of the company's products and services. And so among the, the possible answers that we have here, number C is the most accurate answer. Because again, if we are to think about the return on investment that the company is like, that the investor is likely to have on their investment, if they invest in the UK in the EU subsidiary that Lombards is trying to set up in the UK, what we're trying to what we will need to think about here is basically a long-term type of investment rather than a short-term investment. And as a long-term type of investment, this is a very beneficial type of investment to help you diversify your portfolio. And so it is going to be something that would help that would generate something for you at the end. So on the long term, it is going to be beneficial. However, there is no short term benefits. It's going to be very volatile. And so this is the correct answer, which is basically answer number C. Now, moving on to the next question. When we're talking about the issuance of bonds again, and Lombards is trying to issue bonds, here we're trying to think about the role that banks are play the, the, the role that banks play in the process of issuing bonds. Now, if we try to analyze the different answers, we're going to see that there is only one answer that is very much the correct one. There are no misleading answers here. All of them, you can see that how they do not fit the criteria and how they do not fit the material that we've that we've looked into together. So let's start with number B, C, D, and then we go to the correct answer, which is A. So Question, possible answer number B states that banks will fill in the legal uh, documents on behalf of the uh, of the company, on behalf of Lombards. Again, this is not accurate because this is not the role of banks. Rather, this is the law, role of legal advisors. Now, if we move on to the next possible answer, which is basically number C, and it states that banks are going to help Lombards set the maturity date of the bonds and the maturity dates for bonds. Again, this is not the role of banks. Rather, this is uh, basically the, the, b decided based on the financing needs of the company of Lombards on its own. Now, the last one possible, the last possible answer, which is number D, the inaccurate answer, basically, 
it states that banks will help Lombard banks will help Lombards uh, basically sell. Ah, mixed it up. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, so the last question, the the last possible inaccurate answer is number D, and basically here it states that banks will not only help in selling the bond, but they will determine the price of the bond. And again, the price of the bond is not determined just by the banks, it's rather determined by the market and by the demand on uh, the bond. And so if we go again to number A, which is the correct answer, we can see that bank's role is very much, in th the bank's role is very much limited to, sorry. Okay. Okay. And now, as we can see, the correct answer here is answer number A, which is basically that banks will work with Lombards on organizing the roadshows for these bonds. Now, moving on to the next question, we're again talking about discussing here the, the bonds issued by, by Lombards and trying to understand whether these bonds that are classified as speculative grade bonds what do they mean for investors? Here, you'll need to recall your understanding of the different categories of bonds as we studied together in unit number three. And you also need to understand what does a speculative, speculative grade bond mean? And generally, when we're talking about uh, speculative bonds, here we're talking about bonds that have a um, low credit rating and at the same time they have a high uh, they have a low credit rating because they have a high risk on defaulting and so with that in mind when you recall what speculative great bonds are you can try to analyze them the different possible answers that we have and based on what we have here as you can see a, B, and D are not the correct answers because they're not very much accurate. They do not accurately describe what speculative grade bonds are. Rather, the answer number C is the accurate description of speculative grade bonds. And as we can see, it states that it is subjective that speculative grade bonds, what it means for investors is that they will likely be subjected to additional risks if there are economic meltdowns. So because of their nature, their high risk nature, add to the equation the fact that, that there might be an economic hardship, this could cause an extra layer of, of risk for these investors. Now, if we're looking at the next question, which is basically why would, it, would you recommend in issuing bulldog bonds for, for Lombards, this is very much related to the different types of bonds where as you remember we have international bonds you have foreign we have international bonds foreign bonds you'll need to recall all the data that we studied together in unit number three and so you'll need to understand also what bulldog bonds are and if you remember bulldog bonds are basically bonds that are issued in the UK by a non-UK by a non-UK organization, and the bonds here are dominated in the British uh, in the pound sterling. And of course, these are directed to British investors. And because of this, answer number B is going to be the most accurate answer rather than the the other possible answers that we have here together. Now, if we move on to the next question, which is asking you why you might suggest to investors to trade in, in derivatives that are traded basically over the counter and how these could be a risky, a, a risky type of an investment. Now, this is basically trying to prompt you to remember what derivatives are and their nature as a financial instrument and how they could be a risky type of investment. And normally, if we're talking about derivatives, you will remember that investing in derivatives would expose investors to specific uh, to, to different types of risks, including basically the risk of defaulting on contract uh, on of defaulting before even the company completes its contractual obligations or meets its, its contractual obligations. And because of that, you can see that number D or answer number D is the most accurate answer among uh, the other ones. Now, if we're thinking about 
making a recommendations a recommendation for Lombards, and we're trying to recommend mortgage-backed securities to Lombards. The question here is trying to ask us why would we do such a recommendation, or why would we undergo, why would we recommend such a, a a measure for for Lombards? And here again, what we need to do is recall what we studied in unit number four, and examine what is the nature of mortgage-backed securities. And based on the knowledge that we have about mortgage-backed securities, we know that mortgage-backed securities are basically a uh, type of investment that is backed by a pool of loans and different types of assets. And because of that nature, they offer an attractive rate on return. And thus, answer number C makes it the correct answer. Moving on to the next question here, the question is asking us why we could, re- why would we recommend a crowd lending as one of the possible financing options to Lombards? Again, some of these answers that we have here are not necessarily inaccurate. Rather, there is only one possible, uh, there is only one most accurate answer to this particular scenario. Now. The possible answer here that we have, number A, is that crowd lending, they don't they do not expect repayments. This is, again, misleading, and this is one of the, the inaccurate statements that we have, and thus the, it needs to be disregarded. The next one, which is the fact that they provide, provide flexibility and access to funds, this is, possible, uh, this is a possibly accurate description of crowd lending because they do offer flexibility in how you access funds. And they do also offer somewhat flexibility in how you spend these funds. However, it's not one of its inherent natures. And thus, though these could be some of the exceptions, but we cannot regard them as one of the rules or one of the main areas that would allow us basically to to, to choose these uh, two answers as an accurate answer for, for our case study. However, the most accurate answer that we have here is basically the flexibility in choosing the favorable terms. Because here in crowd lending, and due to the nature of crowd lending, you are able to negotiate the types of, of terms that you want to attach to, to, to this kind of transaction. Now, if we are moving forward to the next to the next question, we're thinking here about Emporium and thinking how Emporium as an investment company is trying to diversify their different investments. The question is trying to ask us, what are some of the recommendations that we can give to Emporium if they are invested in, if they are interested in investing in financial markets? Here, the question is trying to test our knowledge about financial markets. And this is something that we've, that we've revised in unit one together. And here you are expected to look at what convertible debentures are, what guaranteed bonds are, what short-term convertible bonds are, and what commercial papers are. And so as you will see, some of these answers have their, their, I lost the description here, sorry. Oh, I'm still trying to remember what is the word that I was trying to find. <laughs> Sometimes I lose the words and I just remember them in a language that is useless for what I'm trying to use. <laughs> it is a curse. Okay. Let's give it a shot. I, I still can't remember, but hopefully now it will flow. <laughs> Sure. So what I was trying to describe basically is that in the answers, so let's assume that I'm talking about con- uh, convertible debentures. What I've done in the definition of convertible debentures in uh, number A, I've mixed the attributes of that particular definition with the attributes of another definition. So I mixed up con- convertible debentures with short-term conver- uh, convertible bonds. So I'm trying to find the word, a shorter way to describe that what I've done, it's 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 just literally escaping my mind. I can't find it anymore. Okay, maybe if I say that, sure. So basically, let's say debentures and bonds. What I've done, I've mixed the attributes of debentures. So I've described debentures as bonds and bonds as debentures. Just try to you know to to confuse the students if that makes sense. So this is what I've done, and I'm I can't I'm, I'm not, I can't find the word that would describe that. I've mixed things up to try to confuse you. <laughs> yes, exactly, intentionally. Yes, miscorrection is that misdirection. Yes, yeah, I think yes, I think 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I can use trick them in misdirection. Yeah. I think I can use both the two. Thank you. That this is this is actually <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> oh lifesaver. <laughs> okay. I can't remember where I stopped. So I think what we're gonna do maybe go through this this slide again. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Now, now for this question, we are here working with another company. This company is an investment company and they're trying to invest in a different uh, financial markets and in financial markets. And so you are positioned as an advisor and trying to um, provide them with an advice as to how they can diversify their investments and um, how they could basically uh, invest in financial markets. So this question is asking you to basically recall all the data that you've studied in uh, unit number one. And as you can see from the different possible answers that we have, these answers have been misdirected. Uh, you are basically, you will be tricked into, into the different ans into the different possible answers. And as you can see, some of the attributes of convertible dependitures have been mixed up with the attributes of another financial instrument. And so you will need to have a deeper understanding and deeper knowledge of these different financial instruments so that you are able to choose the right answer among these different possible answers. Now, for our particular case and for this particular question, you will see that number C, which is guaranteed bonds, is the most accurate description because the way that it was described is uh, basically in the right way. So what we've stated here is that guaranteed bonds provide a layer of security that interest and principal are to be made by a third party should the issuer default. And this is very much an accurate description of guaranteed bonds. Now, if you want to take commercial papers as a way of example, you will see that commercial papers here, the way that they were described as they allow investors to hold instruments until maturity and collect interest uh, income should the instrument's price decline. Again, this particular description is not the accurate description of commercial paper because it has some attributes of commercial papers and at the same time some attributes of the short-term convertible bonds and so you'll need to have to you'll need to be a little bit more vigilant and you'll have to have a deeper understanding and deeper analysis of the material that we've uh, studied together now to move forward here this question is looking at the debt to equity ratio of the company and is trying to make you calculate and understand which one of these possible answers is the correct answer that would indicate basically the positioning of the company itself. And so here the question is asking us if Lombard's returned earnings are around 100 million dollars and their debt to equity ratio is 0 0.02, what are the company's liabilities? And so how can you calculate company's liabilities? And basically, what are the indicators? What would this indicate? What would your findings indicate? Now, to calculate the liability of, of the company, you'll need to recall the formula for the debt-to-equity ratio. And if you remember, the formula to debt to, of the debt-to-equity ratio is basically debt-to-equity equals uh, total debt over total equity. And so here, what we have retained earnings. So we don't have even the data about the uh, total equity. And to find total equity, we know that total equity basically equals retained earnings plus common stocks and also preferred stocks. And so with this data, what you're expected to do is then to take the data that we have, play with the formula of the debt to equity ratio, and then try to find the, the correct answer. The correct answer for us here is basically two million, two million dollars. And the two million dollars, what this would indicate for us is basically that the company is in a strong position. So once you are able to do the calculations, once you're able to find this data, you'll be able to analyze and make sure that you have the right answer in terms of the indications of what the debt to equity ratio would mean for the company for Lombards. Now, the next question is about Lombard is going through an IPO. And the question is asking you, why would you recommend for Lombards to go through an IPO? And you have different answers. And one of them is basically is the correct answer. Now here, if you want to go undergo an IPO, one of the main things that would help you 
as a an organization or one of the main benefits that would help you as an organization is because you will have access to a pool of funds and because you'll have more funds it will enable you to attract more talent that you will need to be your, to grow your organization and so this is why answer a is the correct answer now again if we look at B, C, and D, B is not necessarily a correct one because the role of middlemen is almost non-existent in this kind of transaction, or it's not one of the benefits of, of going undergoing an IPO. Similarly, it's not about retaining cash, it's rather raising capital to finance investments and to finance growth and operations of an organization. And raise and the number D or the possible answer number D, which is basically about share dilution. Again, this is a little bit misleading. And this would share dilution would very much depend on the type of stocks and the types of shares that are issued and the type of shares that are held by existing shareholders. And as we can see, a benefit of having an IPO or undergoing IPO from among these different possible answers that we have is basically the fact that it would allow us to attract more talent for the organization. Now, the next question is asking us about the one of the countries that the company is trading in, one of the countries that Lombards is trading in, is experiencing some financial hardships. And so these challenges led the IMF to intervene. And as the as part of the IMF's intervention, uh, you are asked to choose one of the possible answers here that would indicate the type of intervention that IMF will undertake. Now, if we look at number B states that the IMF will undertake a structural loan program. This is somewhat misleading because the IMF, the, the, there are specific, uh, specific types of interventions that the IMF would undergo and there isn't anything that is labeled as a structural loan program, nor there is something that is called an adjusted loan program or an adjustment repayment program. The IMF would very much, the IMF's intervention would very much be associated with an adjustment program. And so this is why the question, this is why answer number A is correct, because the, the fact that these other programs that are listed here are non-existent as part of the IMF's, IMF's intervention. Now, looking at the next question here is about Lombards trying to, to issue bonds under Rule 144. Here, we're trying to recall the criterias that are available under Rule 144. This is a very much straightforward question. You'll have to have an understanding of Rule 144 from the SE, from the SE. And so as part of that, it's uh, there, there, there is only one correct answer, so there isn't room for basically misleading in, in, in that respect. And so the correct answer for this scenario is basically this number C, which states that securities should not exceed 1% of the stock outstanding. Now, moving on to uh, you trying to recommend Lombards to invest in stock warrants. Again, this question would very much prompt you to recall the material that you studied in, 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 in units number one and number four about stock warrants. And here, what we have only one correct answer, the other answers are inaccurate and incorrect. And the correct one here for us is number B, because based on our understanding for stock warrants would help us buy the underlying stock at a fixed exercise price until their expiration date. And this is one of the benefits that we'll have from stock warrants. Now, the next question is all about why you could why you might recommend Lombards to issue stock warrants as one of its financing options. Again, here you have only one correct answer. So the other ones are misleading and they're not accurate. The right answer that we have here is basically answer number B, which states that it allows Lombards to pay lower interest rates or and low, or lower dividends, basically. Now, moving on to the next question is how would when would it be possible for Lombards to have its stocks outstanding? Now, this is a somewhat of a tricky question because here you would need to recall the material about unit number four and unit number one. Those that are related to basically stock issuance and you'll need to understand what is a stock outstanding, what stock outstanding is and how stocks are traded. Now, if we look at, if we try to analyze the uh, possible answers that we have, answer number A states that in secondary markets, 
after authorized shares are traded in primary markets. Now, this is not entirely wrong, but also it's not very accurate description. As we will see, answer number B is the correct one because yes, there are some attributes to question number A, though vaguely related, that resembles what, what stock outstanding is all about, but it is not the accurate description of of the stock outstanding. Now, for us, number B is the correct one because after public investors owning author, after public investors have, I'm mixing it up again. Sorry. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm fine. As we can see, question number the possible answer number B is the accurate one. And here, what is what it specifies is that investors who hold or own these authorized shares. They trade with them in the secondary markets. And there is only, and this is why the answer number B is the most accurate answer among the different ones. C and D are, are entirely inaccurate. And so they need to be disregarded rather than be looked into from a possibility of choosing them. Now, moving on to the next question is about you working with Lombards and trying to explain the nature of preferred dividends. And how here the question is, how do you think cumulative preferred shares will come to Lombard's um, advantage? Now, this question, there is only one answer here. There is no misleading answers. And so the correct answer is number D, which basically states that if Lombard does not create enough profit to pay preferred dividend, these dividends must be paid before any common stock dividends. So again, this is a very strong straightforward question. There is no room for misleading. There are there are no room for inaccurate for possible answers. If it that's good. <laughs> it came to my aid now. <laughs> okay. Great. And as we can see that there is no room for, for other possible answers because all the other answers are basically inaccurate and incorrect. And number B is the correct answer for this particular scenario. Now, moving on to the next question, uh, the next question asks basically, which of the following instruments would you recommend to your client who is looking to invest in Lombard's shares? Well, the question is asking you about the different types of shares that are out there, and it tests your knowledge as to what these shares are and the nature of these different shares. And as you will see, the different possible answers here some of them are misleading some of them have been mixed up and so the question is trying to test your deep understanding of the different categories of shares and for us the correct answer here is number b preferred shares at uh, number d preferred shares because preferred shares according to the definition that we have which is an accurate definition is that preferred shares offer equity ownership and they benefit from dividends. Now, if you look at common shares, the, diff the way that they've been described, the way that it was described in this particular possible answer, number A, is that they grant investors a say in, a comp in the company. Now, again, this is not entirely wrong because common shares do provide investors with the right to have a say in an organization. But what kind of benefit would I have as an investor if I'm only having a say in an organization? Now, for a company like Lombards that is trying to increase its own portfolio and diversify its portfolio, an organization that is trying to gain maximum exposure and get as well at the same time more return on their investment, what they would be looking into is perhaps dividends rather than having a say in our organization. They may not necessarily be interested in having control over the organization, rather they would be interested mostly in what can they get, what kind of benefits or financial benefits that they could get out of uh, their investment in, in the organization. And thus, your role as an advisor for this organization is to explain why would they benefit from using something or from investing in one particular financial instrument over the other. And again, as we said, it's not necessarily that the answer is wrong or one of the answers is going to be wrong, but there would only be one more accurate way or an accurate answer to, to choose. Now, if you look at nominated chairs and the way that the nominated chairs are described here is 
the fact that they offer an extra layer of protection in case of default. Now, this is a misleading answer because this is not an attribute of, of nominated shares. Nominated shares are basically shares that have their the name of the investor registered to them. So these shares are very much attached to the investor themselves. And so the extra layer of protection in case of default is not necessarily related to nominated shares. Similarly, if we look at class B shares, and the way that they've been described here is that because they allow preferred access to companies capital. And again, these you have to recall the different classes of shares and you'll have to recall the material that we studied together in uh, that we've been through together in, in, in unit one to enable you to reach the correct conclusions. Now, if we move to the next uh, question is basically why might you recommend that Emporium invest in guaranteed bonds? Now, again, this is trying to test your knowledge about guaranteed bonds, what guaranteed bonds are and how they work. And basically, if we are looking at guaranteed bonds, based on the descriptions that we have, question number B is the most accurate question. Possible answer number B is the most is the most accurate answer that we have. And so what it states or the way that it describes guaranteed bonds or the, the benefit that we will get from guaranteed bonds is the fact that Emporia, it would provide Emporium with a type of security from receiving interest and principal payments in case the issuer defaults. Now, if we move on to the last question, which is basically why would a diluted earning per share be a worst case scenario for the financial standing of loan bars? Here, the what you are trying, what the question is trying to ask you is trying to prompt you to is prompting you to recall what you know about earnings per share and about dilu share dilution and how share dilution works. And as we know. Uh, when we think about share dilution and how it could be basically the worst case scenario for you as an organization, because share dilution, basically what it would do, it would mean that you could receive stocks that, you know, that I'm mixing it up. Sorry for that. All right. Just give me a second. Let me try to, and we'll go for it. Okay. And so as we can see, number C is the most accurate answer for this particular scenario. And the reason being is because the way that it was described that basically investors here could receive stocks that they did not purchase for face value. And so if they are, if they haven't purchased these stocks for face value, that means it is the worst case scenario for the company itself because it did not receive any profits on those or it did not receive the face value that was expected on those particular shares that were issued. And so this is the kind of thinking and this is the kind of analysis that we could deploy when we look at case studies and when we're trying to analyze the different possible answers that we have. This is how we can reach the correct answers and how we can basically ensure that we are on the right track when analyzing the different attributes of our case and the uh, questions that we have for these cases. Um, I hope this prepared you very well. And um, I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you.